All right, we are live. I think we're good to go. <laughs> All right. Awesome. All right. Let's get started, Boom and Nick. All right, we are live. Fantastic. I think we're good to go. <laughs> All right. Awesome. All right. So just give me one sec. Okay. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. I would like to welcome you to our ninth episode of Let's Talk Startups in Africa, a speaker series of fireside chats with entrepreneurs and investors that are paving the way in Africa. Today, we're very excited for our special guest, Nick Imudia, co-CEO at Kong Group. But before we get started, let me tell you a little bit more about Africa Startup Lab. Africa Startup Lab is an organization whose mission is to empower entrepreneurs solving Africa's biggest challenges by bridging the information, resource, and financing gap. Before we kick off the interview, a few housekeeping rules. The talk will be interview format, and we will open up the second half of the talk to questions from the audience. So we invite you to post your question on the live stream, chat, as well as to use the network with one another on LinkedIn uh, and use the handles to connect with us. You can also use the LinkedIn event chat for questions. I will kick it off to Boom and Nick. And thank you, Nick, for being here. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. All right. Thank you very much, Anthony, for that introduction. Nick, good afternoon. And thank you for joining us here on Let's Talk Startups in Africa. We are very happy to have you. So to kick us off, would you please mind giving an introduction to the audience here today? Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Nick Imudia. I'm the co-CEO of Conga Group. Um, Conga is actually celebrating its 90 year anniversary in the month. So we've been around for, for some time. Um, the, as you all probably know, Conga is an omni-channel company that has, um, it's one of the largest marketplace uh, platform in Africa, predominantly in Nigeria for now. Um, we have a retail arm to the business, physical stores, trying to um, meet the customers wherever they are. Under the Conga umbrella, of course, we have multiple companies, or we call them subsidiaries. We have the financial arm of the company, a FinTech called Conga Pay. We also have a logistics company that uh, delivers to all parts of the country. Um, we can reach every local, uh, every local government in Nigeria at the moment. We, have, uh, we are launching actually two key businesses this month, which is the Conga Food Delivery and then Conga Health Distribution. So that is in a nutshell what Conga is all about. And hopefully within the next couple of minutes or within the hour you know a little bit more about us and what we do for 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 the country so it's a pleasure Pleasure. being here thank you once again for inviting me yes thank you very much for that introduction there's quite a bit to unpack and you know congo was has been one of the first and foremost online retailers on the continent you know kind of ushering that that e-commerce wave back in 2012, like you mentioned. So I think you know people are very familiar with with Conga and are very the people that watch this would definitely be very interested to to know about the journey. So before we go into Conga specifically, I know that you joined Conga about three years ago, if I'm not mistaken. You know, what was your journey? You know, what's your your background before Conga and how did you, you know, what ushered you or what brought you to Conga? What decided what made you decide to join Conga in, in 2018? Oh, great. Um, before Conga, I worked for two companies, um, only two companies in my life. Um, as you probably can see from my face, I'm not that young. Um, so I worked for I worked for Nokia in Finland, Singapore, Dallas, and a few countries for almost 17 years. So what brought me back to Africa was Nokia. I was the regional VP for Nokia, managing West and Central Africa for a few years. After the acquisition of Microsoft, after the acquisition of Nokia by Microsoft, I became the regional director for West and Central Africa for Arcatel. 
managing their devices business in this part of the world. And about three and a half years ago, the, the Zynos Group, the chairman of Zynos Group, Mr. Leo Staneke, asked me to run a small project for him, and that is to do the merger and acquisition of Conga. He was then very interested in acquiring Conga. And of course, a lot of people were interested in acquiring from NASPAS. NASPAS owned Conga predominantly then. So I spent a couple of months doing the negotiation dealings with the, the NASPAS team and working with the current owner, which is the Zynos um, chairman, to negotiate the deal. So after the acquisition of the company, naturally they asked me to stay behind and help run the, run the company. So for three and a half years, I've been um, working with my co-CEO, Namde, to turn the company around. And this was a company that was losing millions of Naira monthly to verge of profitability over a period of three months. We needed to, to, to sort of dig deep in uh, turning the company around, which I'm very happy we've done over the past three years. That is in a nutshell my story, how I joined Conga and where we are. Yeah, and, and thank you very much for, for, for sharing that because I think there, there is a lot to be said around like what happened ever since 2018. I think there was some media coverage around, you know, Conga and the difficulties that they had been by that time, but there is not a lot on the internet around what happened beyond that time. And I'm, I'm actually very happy to hear that you've been able to, to, to turn the business around. And I'm sure the audience would love to hear more about how you did it, what were the challenges that you encountered you know, when, when you first got there and, and you know, where the business is today. So I'm, I'm very excited and pumped about, you know, the conversation here today. So, so when joining in, in 2018, and it seemed like you were very active in finalizing the mergers and acquisition, you know, what were the challenges that you, you know, that you pinpointed? And I think that's actually something, it's a, it's a great topic because I think, you know, we don't talk enough about, you know, entrepreneurship through acquisition on the continent. A lot of the businesses are are started, you know, from 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 the founding team and and kind of grown. So, how was it to come in, you know, as as an acquirer and you know, kind of walk us maybe through those those deal preparation days before the the, the merger was actually finalized? Um. It was very difficult in the sense that I call it a race to the bottom. So if you look at the e-commerce days, if you look at the e-commerce companies those days, it was, Conga was predominantly online and there were, there were a lot of money spent on marketing with little or no return. Um, so between Conga and its competitors, they were sort of, I call it a race to the bottom. Who's going to spend the most, the most money? And who's going to discount the most products in a way who's going to lose the most money basically to acquire customers customer acquisition was the goal so when we came in the biggest problem was how do you stop the leakage meaning there was so much money being lost on um, marketing on all sort of spending expenditure on logistics on i would say product discounts so the bigger question for me then was, how do we stop the leakage? How do you turn a company that is losing close to $1 million, $1.5 million a month around, um, bearing in mind that the e-commerce space in Nigeria is still very small, yeah? So that was the bigger challenge that we had. Um, we started basically after the acquisition, where I said to the group chairman, we basically rolled our sleeves and said, okay, that's why you haven't heard a lot about us. We needed to put a lot of basics in place, things around infrastructure to stop uh, stealing, for instance, um, upgrading technology, um, managing merchants' returns, um, investing in more assets for logistics, because if customers are not happy, they will not come back um spending in marketing wisely those were sort of it, it sounds very small those are like small moves but those were the big big things that we, we we did so while we were cutting cost on one end 
we were investing heavily on infrastructure because we knew that once the infrastructure and the basics were in place, turning around the company would be much faster. So on one hand, we were spending time cutting costs, fixing all the holes, removing all the leakages. On the other hand, we were spending money building warehouses, in, investing in fleets of assets, even recruiting more arms to the company. Then we did something I would say probably the biggest move was merging Conga and Udala. Because Udala was a very successful um, company that was an it was the first omnichannel company in Africa. So we merged Conga, the e-commerce arm that was very strong, the logistics arm that was very strong with the physical stores that Udala had. So we, we started implementing things like order online and pick up in store, um, go to the store, order if you want something, uh, you want something in store and those things are not there, you can order them online and they will be brought to you at home. We, we turned around the logistics, making sort of changing the way we worked with the, um, what we call the, the flex companies to make sure that they were able to deliver faster. So bringing these two companies together made it easier for us to achieve the omni-channel setup, making it easier because at the end of the day, Nigerians still struggle to trust the online business as, as at, the, at the time, right? It was still, payment was still very difficult. Logistics was still very difficult. It is still very, very difficult. But by introducing the physical stores, pick up points, people can view, see the products, complain if they, if they are not happy, it made it easier for a lot of people to adopt into the, into the business. So since then, we've really grown almost a thousand percent in terms of revenue, in terms of um, um, customer base, and in terms of our logistics reach. So we've really, really turned it around. So those earlier days, I would say the bigger, the, 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 the bigger things we did were rolling down our sleeves, realizing that we were not in competition with anybody, we were in competition with ourselves. That, that realization was very important because there is this false competition where you are competing with people and you have absolutely no clue where you're going, right? So we stop, as, as you, you will notice that I will not mention competition a lot in this chat, but we decided not to compete with the, with the obvious competition at the time, but to compete with ourselves. And we set out, the, the strategy was very clear for ourselves. The goals were very clear to ourselves and we executed according to the strategy. And we believe that if we did that very well, um, the results will show and the competition will know what we've been doing. Those were the things we, we did. Yeah, that's actually a, a great point, you know, being in competition with yourself and really focusing on making the internal and necessary structural changes to be able to achieve your long-term objective. Now, it requires a certain level of conviction, you know, in deciding to acquire a company, knowing that, like you mentioned, it was losing tremendous amount of revenue and there were quite, it was quite an uphill battle to, to, to turn it around. So what were those early indicators when you were doing your due diligence and coming in that made you believe and trust that you would be able to turn around the business and turn it to a profitable one at some point in a close future? There were three indicators. One, Conga brand was very strong. Um, the, the brand was good and the brand is still very good. Um, when you look at the brand metrics around marketplace, e-commerce, omni-channel, Conga is up there. So the brand was very, was very, very strong and we believed in the brand. The second one was we believed very much in the technology. The, the, the implementation of the marketplace, one of the first to implement marketplace in Africa, um, we believe that the processes around marketplace was very important. Um, reach was very important. And the third one was that we did genuinely believe that Conga had good people, yeah? So when you have a good brand, you have good technology and smart people in the industry, what we needed to do, the investor had one target for me and he said, Nick, look, 
I need you to institute good processes, good corporate governance, clear strategy, and we'll run. So that has been the mantra from the one. Why we believed in the brand, the, we believed in what we're doing, we believed very much in the people, technology was sound, renewing those technology was a walk in the park, therefore instituting corporate governance, because coming from a European company, having worked for a European company all my life, built management systems in Europe, in Singapore and in the US, bringing them to Nigeria was not very, very difficult. We just needed to institute that, stick to those goals that we've set for ourselves and implemented to the latter. And that was what we did. That's, that's, that's amazing. I'd love to double click on that corporate governance because it's, it's, it's something that comes up a lot you know, when, okay. when we talk about doing business in Africa. So what were the tactics or techniques that you leveraged to, to instill and instore that corporate governance, the proper corporate governance within the organization? A few pointers, lessons, and, and, and tactics that you used to, to make sure that the, the ideal corporate governance came, came to be. Um, the first things were processes. You, we needed to ensure that there were sound policies and processes. These processes are independent of individuals, right? So that when I remove an, a person from a system, the processes will continue to run. The reporting at the end of that process was sound. So for me to institute a, a good corporate governance, the processes needed to be clear the policies needed to be clear and the reporting structure needed to be clear. So we needed to build what I call the ethically sound process, meaning everything is measurable, everything can be accounted for, and at any given point in time, my boss can call me and say, Nick, where are we? What did we do? Where is the flow of cash? Where is the flow of product? Where is the complaint? then I can measure everything from the beginning to the end, yeah? And ability to report that to the board was what made us stand out. And that is exactly what we are still doing today. Ensuring that you have some processes, measurable processes that are independent or agnostic of individuals, the policies are sound and clear reporting structure into the board that made us, um, that gave us what we needed to do. And I think one key element often in being able to sustain the proper corporate government governance is having the people abide and remain motivated to follow these processes. Can you tell us a little bit of, about how, you know, Conga motivates and motivates its people and what are the few things in place to, to help maintain, you know, the corporate governance and kind of within the people from a, from a people perspective? Success is the greatest motivator of people, all right? If you define a process and you say, okay, this is what we're going to do. It used to be done this way, this, we're gonna change it this way. And this is, what we, this is the output. And this is how we're going to measure the output. At first, there is always skepticism. People are sort of not sure, is this something we really want to do? When you are able to run through the flow once and the success is seen, and they actually see that this process is improving the way we work, people are naturally motivated. Um, I strongly believe that that success and ability to define the success, clarity of purpose always motivate staff. There is no one on earth that wants to work for a failing process, or there is no one that wants to work for a company that is failing. Yeah. So if I'm able to paint what I call good, if I'm able to explain what good looks like, and we run through the journey, at the end of the journey, you actually see good, it motivates people. That is number one. Number two is to be ethically sound. Yeah. If I am ethically sound, when I explain to people what ethically sound processes are, they would understand. If I live by that mantra, people will live by that mantra. Where it fails, however, is if I am preaching A and I'm doing B, it's very difficult to motivate them. So we've created a system where 
I am very hermetically sound, my boss is ethically sound. We, we, we document the processes very clearly. There is reward usually at the end of the day, reward always comes in form of success. And when they see that and you can measure and you appreciate them, they are motivated. Um, I do not believe that salary is the primary motivator of staff. I do not believe that um, incentives is the only motivator. Of I think people are really motivated by success. I think success motivates people. When you can explain what that success looks like and they actually can experience it. Uh, that's that's yeah. an amazing point. So there are a few questions that are coming in. And yeah. I, know, I know you mentioned that you didn't want to talk about competition. But people are very curious. So I'll let I'll let Anthony ask a question. <laughs> yes, one yes, one of the questions we're we're getting is what are the difference between Kanga and Jumia? Okay, fair. <laughs> um, Jumia and okay, like I said, when we acquired, all right, you mentioned it. When we acquired, it was a race to the bottom. That is, everybody is chasing that thingy, and. The first thing we needed to do, which I, I, I instituted with the help of my, of the chairman, was to stop that competition. It was not needed for two reasons. One, the space is so wide. The market, the, 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 the sort of the market is enough for everybody. I welcome competition. I want competition to come. Um, if you look at organized retail in Nigeria, it's still around 2%. So you still have this golf of people to reach. Therefore, competition will help that growth. Competition is good for, for consumers. The biggest difference is that we are truly an omni-channel um, company. We have physical stores. We have physical retail, about 35 retail locations across the country. We have built, a, we have a FinTech, Conga Pay, which is a CBN licensed, sorry, mobile money licensed company. So we can actually operate a digital bank. We don't, when we say we are a FinTech, we're just not a FinTech on paper. We're a FinTech by license and all of that. So the biggest difference I would say is while we are sort of dealing with the same customer, our strategy is a little bit different. We want to operate an omni-channel um, company my second belief is that we want to be able to sell to anyone that wants to buy. It doesn't matter where you are. If I have to send you that goods by a dove or by flying eagle, I will send it to you. If you want to receive money in any way, shape or form, I will accept it. So those are the things we've done that we are a truly omni-channel company. Wherever you are, whoever you are, you can reach us and we can reach you. Um, so that is the main difference. Um, Jumia is, it's just an e-commerce company, while we are an omni-channel company with multiple companies inside of it. Double-clicking on, on, on that omni-channel strategy, how has you know the implementation of it gone so far and what initial success is? Because it's been three years that you decided to you know kind of turn that around. And I mean, it takes time you know, to, to roll all these businesses up and, and get them up to, up to speed. You know, if you could share a little bit with the audience, you know, where, you know, the, the, the payment system is, the logistics business and, you know, the food and, and, and delivery businesses are, and, you know, a few, a few lessons that you've gathered along the way. Um, the omni-channel setup requires, um, you have to be detailed. Okay, you need to have clarity of purpose. Yeah. With the physical retail, it's first capital intensive, relies heavily on people's engagement to deal with customers. Um, it relies heavily on assets being on the ground in terms of products being on the ground. Um, when I go into a retail store, I want to see certain products, certain assortment, and those products need to be there. The success for Conga over the past three years has been built around that strategy. That is, people that cannot reach us online can actually reach us offline in a physical mode. Um, people that cannot pay online 
can use any of our Conga Pay agents to pay. So we do have Conga Pay agents, what I call the agency network across the country, where you can do cash in, cash out, where you can do um, payments, and in the stores you can do collection of goods. To be honest, in Africa, the addresses are still an issue, um, logistics mm -hmm. are an issue, but we bring these products as close as possible to you, and then you can pick up from there in any of our locations. So these things, the omni-channel strategy, while it sounds easy, is capital intensive. It's heavy lifting. It's when I, I use the word, probably this is the 20th time we rolled our sleeves. We, we really have to be there, detailed. You have to be specific on processes. There is no shortcuts. There are no merchants, it's you. And that is what we've done to turn this um, whole thing around. And considering that your your, your merchants, I mean, are, are probably is, is the target in terms of leveraging your payment solution. How have you seen the adoption the adoption of your of your other products to with respect to the merchant uh, base on your platform? It is an ecosystem, right? Um, the, the the irony of doing e-commerce omni-channel in Nigeria or in Africa is that you have to build some of these capabilities yourself and you have to leverage on the ecosystem. There are two or three predominant factors that you need, which we all know. You need the internet penetration. You need to have internet for you to do anything. Um, even if I have internet, I have to be able to pay for the goods that I have I've ordered. And that is where your payment. So some of the, the capabilities we have where we did not just acquire them for the fun of it, we acquired them because it was a necessity right? We realized that payment was an issue. We needed to be able to collect. We needed to be able to pay. So we acquired the license. We acquired a company, um, Z Internet, and that has fixed the, the payment problem. Even at that, the payment systems or the payment companies require the banking infrastructure, require the telecom infrastructure. In Nigeria, we still talk about OTP all the time. So you seem to be able to receive your messages, you still need to be able to receive the one-time uh, passwords or codes to be able to complete your payment. So you still require these guys. Thirdly, you need to have a sound logistics system. Um, people underestimate the effort that goes into logistics. People underestimate the challenges with logistics when it comes to bad roads, the assets, addresses, um, security and all of those. So we then acquired, we, we built a logistics company with all the licenses. We built all the network, we had all the assets. So what we really did was to create a lot of exchange centers so that the movement of goods and the exchange of goods were much faster. And that was actually what brought us to the omni-channel setup where we said, okay, some of these retail outlets could also be used as a pickup points. And that was how all of this came together. In terms of the other companies, what we have created is a pipeline. Because we have a very good logistics system, um, it's very easy for us to start delivering food if we, if we really want to. The reason we hadn't done it was because of COVID. Um, with the systems were built, processes were ready, assets were good to go, then COVID hit. So we decided to stay back a little bit. So introducing these new companies or new capabilities into our ecosystem is easy because we have the foundation in place. We have the warehouses in place. We have the processes in place. We have the corporate governance, governance in place. And most importantly, it doesn't matter what you're delivering. It comes down to three things. My ability to, to, to deliver, my ability to collect, right? So if I can deliver the products, I'm able to collect my funds. Why not? With a very sound customer um, experience centers, 24 hours, you can call in, we can deal with your problems. Once you have these capabilities in place, adding new capabilities is quite simple and easy. And that's what we're doing. And it's not going to end, by the way. We will add more capabilities as we go. For sure. I'm sensing that. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, sen I'm sensing the, 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 the breadth of, of, of future businesses under the Conga Group umbrella coming. So definitely we'll be keen to, to follow those rollouts. 
So there, there's another question that, that came in in the chat and I'll, I'll let Anthony ask it. Absolutely. Thank you, Boom. And I know you've already touched on some of the challenges, but the question here is really, what are the main challenges of doing business in Nigeria as a retailer? Um, I've touched based on all of them, right? I've, I've said if we doing business in Nigeria is quite broad context, right? the, the terminology depends on the type of business. Um, if I focus on the businesses that we are in or the business that we are in, which is building a nominee channel platform that caters for the consumers, basically any product you want, you can find. There are traditionally three problems, but I've always added a fourth. <laughs> the, the first one is, of course, in our business is the internet penetration, which is a challenge. Um, logistics is a challenge. If you can fix those two, you are in good shape. Um, the third one, people underestimate, and that is payment. People are not, probably because of the way the society is, people still require payment on delivery. They want payment on delivery. They appreciate payment on delivery. They are not very comfortable um, leaving their credit card or paying before they receive the goods. Um, Prepayment is still below 30%, which means that you still have to cater for this huge number of people, um, meaning returns, meaning cancellations and things like that. But then the fourth, the fourth challenge, if you can deal with it, it's a very big thing, is capability. People capability. Finding the right set of people that, sorry, sorry I call it human capital type of capabilities people that can understand your vision, buy into that vision, understand the processes you want to build and key into those processes is very difficult, yeah? So that last one, do not underestimate human capital. Um, and for you to solve that problem, you need to have clarity in, in, in you have to be very clear. Um, like I said, in our case, corporate governance, ethically sound processes were our goal, and we needed people to understand that. And that was how we built the, the processes and built the company to where we are today. So the, the challenges are always around infrastructure, internet penetration, logistics is still a major challenge, payment is still a challenge, and finally, which I'm adding gradually as we go, is human capital. And having the right capital that you need is critical. So it, it seems like Conga is hiring <laughs> actively. <laughs> Conga is always hiring. Um, we are always hiring because the growth, um, the growth that we are seeing and the growth that we seek, we require human capital, some human capital that buys into our vision. Yes, so we are always hiring. So, so I'd love to double click on that customer behavior piece that you touched on is, you know, people are not comfortable prepaying, you know, they would love to pay on delivery. They want to touch the good, you know, before, before they pay, which probably, I mean, it's, it's, you would prefer if, you know, if you know, it was prepaid or, you know, the payment was done beforehand, is there an active effort in shifting that behavior? And if so, how? Um, you, we have to shift the behavior for multiple reasons. One, with the payment on delivery process, cancellation rate is very high, return rate is very high because people tend to change their mind. Um, even if that was what you wanted, by the time the product comes to you, you can prioritize something else over the product. What we are doing is, like I said, that was why we acquired um, Conga Pay. That was why we have the license to make it easy for customers to pay however you want to pay, be it paying using our agents, be it USSD card, bank transfer. Um, like I said, even sending a dove from the Conga headquarters to where you are to collect money and back, I don't mind. The goal is for us to make it easier for the customers to pay, that is one. Second thing is to make them more comfortable, ensuring that their data is secured, 
that when you give us your information, you know for sure the information will be safe and will be secured. And with multiple payment um, uh, methods coming on ground, now we are talking very soon about blockchain, cryptos and stuff like that, is to basically make it easy for anyone that want to pay however you want to pay, to, to, to pay. That is what we are doing. And that is a, a, a critical element of our growth strategy. That's actually very interesting that you mentioned crypto and blockchain. I mean, recently the the Ministry of Finance instituted a ban on 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 those. How do you plan? You know, have there been talks with the with the government to to kind of change the regulation around that, or is that something that is on hold until the environment is a little bit more favorable? Is that that specific component of your payments business. Um, what we are doing is that we are following the regulations and following the discussions and the charters around the policies and the processes around that. What we believe is that when that time comes, we want to be ready. When the government decides that this is going to be a payment method, we want to make sure we're on forefront of it. If they say tomorrow you accept Dogecoin or Bitcoin, we want to be ready. And, <laughs> and that is going to be the fact. So, we will not, we will not um, do anything that is against the, the government policies. We will follow the policies. We will, um, we will trend accordingly. We will, we will guide, we will advise. Um, but what we want to do is that we want to be ready so that whenever the, the, it becomes a payment method, absolutely we'll be there. Okay, so Nick, I think everybody in the audience is very curious now if you are actually a cryptocurrency holder and i like to preface this this is not investment advice <laughs> cryptos are risky <laughs> so do your own research but Nick, go ahead absolutely not um I'm okay not crypto. I'm absolutely not discussing <laughs> cryptocurrency at the moment um as a as a as a company what we want to do um just to prefix that is when it becomes a legal payment method, an official payment method, we want to be there because we want to make it easy for consumers to pay however they want to. Um, I believe that we are a broker. We have a product, we have a merchant, we have consumers. And anything that goes through our pipeline must comply with the regulators and we will be ready when that is also ready. Thank you very much. Now, really wanted to talk a little bit around just maybe the future of retail or your predictions around where retail will go within Nigeria, even Africa at large. You know, we've seen one of the trends that we see here with, with Amazon is, you know, that the fulfillment business, they're fulfilled by Amazon business where, you know, retailers, Amazon kind of deals with everything and they're, you know, like very sophisticated, you know, brands that are, that are popping up and actually, you know, having pretty high valuations for for the businesses that they for the brands that they set up do you think that the a similar environment could come to be in in africa and if so how soon the retail space there is so much growth potential in the retail space um what i when we discuss with my my boss the owner of the company is everybody wants good experience right? Everybody wants the latest and the best of the best. We believe that the omni-channel strategy that we have, even Amazon is going through that, um, most of the companies are doing that, starting to have physical retail, yeah? What that does to you is that you are able to take control of certain product lines, like you said. I want to be able to control one or two products, land it into the country, quality sound, price sound and distribute across the entire country. That is why as part of our portfolio, we have what is called the Conga Bulk. Conga Bulk allows for resellers of products to come into our ecosystem, say, okay, these products we think is very good, help us bring it in volume, in bulk, huge volumes, and we will help you resell them. So, and that is one of the things that we started exactly one year ago and that have made our revenue grow up significantly. So you would have um, a popular product because people are not, they don't have access to much cash. They can buy one or two or three for resale. 
we help them bring them in bulk, in volumes, similar to the way Amazon does. And then resellers will come into our pipeline, buy these products, and then distribute to um, end users. What is the advantage of that? It guarantees the quality of the supply chain. If I tell you these products are coming in, they are coming in. If I tell you the quality of the product is like this, the quality is measurable. And then we take the financial risk of bringing these products in, managing supply chain, and getting the consumers very good products. And that is what we do. We believe that retail will go in that mode. We believe that you will not be able to get rid of the physical retail anytime soon. Um, if you look at what is happening in the US, even Amazon is, is investing in physical retail. Of course, those are um, sort of uh, human contactless shops. I believe those are coming into this country as well. Um, and I do believe that physical retail is here to stay for a very long period of time. Uh, sure. and, and, and double clicking into just being able to, um, um, you mentioned, that was the last point, kind of just slipped away. The, can you, uh, I've complete, I'm kind of blanking on the last point you just made on the adoption of, how was it? I'm just letting you go through the pain. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, no, like I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out. So, so, so we were talking about the future of retail and you mentioned that um, the, the omni channel is like, you believe, okay, yeah, the bulk business, that's it, that's it. And I came back to me, right. So, and, and you bear the cost of, of, of that. Do you like how can you walk us through how you do your product selection and you know maybe some of the successful kind of like product lines that you've seen and you know kind of like you know how 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 that process comes to be in terms of okay we're going to source this material in bulk and I have the resellers ready to 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 distribute it down down the supply chain. It comes to data, actually, it comes to, um, I don't want to go as far as saying AI, is basically the use of data, understanding what products are trending, what people want, and what they really, really want in good quality and good price. Now, Conga being Conga, we have the trust of um, OEMs. We have trust of big manufacturers globally. Um, we can control some of their supply chain. We can control some of their products because they trust us enough that we will fulfill accordingly. So the, the, the way it works is that using the data, understanding the system, understanding the process that, that products that are training over a period of time, we make a bet, yeah? Based on that data, bringing drones of these products, empower resellers to take these products and then sell to end, end, end customers. By doing so, we free up their working capital. They don't need to worry about huge working capital. We, they don't need to worry about customs and duties. They don't need to worry about relationships with OEMs because we handle all of that based on our, on our relationship with them and based on the trust that they have for us. So we take the heavy lifting away from them. And at the end of the day, we just bring these popular products at the right price, right quality to the consumers. Thank you. So talking about, and I apologize for that, for that brain freeze earlier. I was, I, I was I trying wanted to, to let you, I wanted <laughs> to let you freeze a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was, I was looking for the bulk word and, and that was the trigger. So I, I kept, I kept searching. Anyways, uh, I apologize for that slight, for that slight freeze. Now talking about scale and the future of, of Conga, you know, currently very active in Nigeria and a massive operation, you know, several businesses, like you mentioned, and a strong physical footprint. You know, what are your plans around scaling potentially across other African countries? If so, do you have a specific kind of like strategy in mind? Um, I would be lying to you if I say we are not thinking of global expansion. Um, I would be lying if I said that it's not on top of mind at the moment. Um, we had our strategies lined up in terms of rolling out other countries until COVID hit. Um, that made it a little bit difficult in terms of feasibility studies, 
traveling, moving around um, into some of these countries. So we decided to take a pause on it. Now that COVID is gradually, we are seeing the end of it, thanks to science and thanks to the different vaccines around. Um, we are refreshing those strategies. And of, unfortunately, I won't be able to go into which country when, but I can clearly say that is, is on top of our mind and it's, some, it's a strategy that we'll absolutely implement um, within a short period of time. And thank, thank you, and I understand that you might not be able to disclose everything. You know, you have a specific model, which in based on what you said, is kind of building your, your advantage, your competitive advantage in, in, in terms of being an omni-channel company. That definitely comes in with some difficulties to scale. So when going to other countries, do you plan on replicating exactly that or leveraging local partners for pieces of you know the, the current business model that you have in Nigeria? The actual strategy, the actual entry strategy into other countries are still being worked on as we speak. However, there are key components of our strategy that cannot be compromised. The compromises that we will not accept are around infrastructure. We will not compromise on payment capabilities. We will not compromise on our logistics capabilities and we will not compromise on our exchange centers, yeah? Now, having said that, we will most likely partner in some of these capabilities when we get to these countries. Um, we believe that it's an ecosystem we are building and this ecosystem require players into that system. And we will leverage on that ecosystem and partner with whoever has the best capabilities in those countries if we don't have it ready. But what we do have ready to scale is our technology, which is ready to go and is scalable and can be used wherever we, wherever we are. But some capabilities cannot be compromised. And those are um, infrastructure, um, sort of internet infrastructures must be there. Logistics capabilities must be there. Payment capabilities must be there. Everything else will partner, work with people that are best in those countries and then give the consumers the best services that they could ever have, have had. Thank you. So Anthony, I see a lot of questions coming in in terms of the chat. Do you want to ask one or two of them? Absolutely. All right, so, I mean, I know it's a little bit going back towards, um, you know, the competition, but one of the questions that one of the participants was really interested to in getting an answer is really, okay, we're seeing that, you know, the foundation are still getting established in terms of logistics. And, you know, that's the main hurdle that groups like Conga are facing. But the question is, in the near future, what does it look like? from foreign companies such as Amazon or even potentially Mercado Libre to enter Nigeria. Is that something that you could foresee happening? Is it something that's a crazy thought that we're not there yet? Or is it something that could be possible and it's, it's a threat? Yeah, so what I have, what I, have as I said that earlier, is that we've spent three years building those capabilities in place. We have putting those capabilities in place. And we are very proud of those capabilities and they are, they are world-class capabilities. So we believe that those capabilities we have in place can compete with anyone um, and actually surpass any capabilities anybody can bring into the country. So we are very happy. And that is what explains the turnaround that we've, we've seen in the company. The other thing I've said is that we genuinely welcome competition because competition is very good for consumers. We do laugh internally that it doesn't matter who the competition is, the problems are exactly the same. The roads are not going to suddenly get better because Amazon is in Nigeria. <laughs> or the payment system, payment infrastructure is not going to suddenly get better because Amazon is here. So we want them to come because when they come, collectively we will improve on all these infrastructures and this infrastructure will benefit, the consumers will benefit from them. So we genuinely, genuinely want competition to come into the country, bearing in mind that we are still catering for less than two, three, um, two, three percent of the organized retail. So there is so much room to grow 
And the more competition comes, the faster we get to that promised land. And since we are local, we know the system. We know how it works. We know what the problems are. We've dealt with it. We've fixed it. And we can fix whatever challenges we have in the future. That's, that's a great answer for whoever is listening in. And now the next question, the next two questions. One is a personal question, given that I come from a beverage background. I was really curious about, I saw that you're selling Coca-Cola and you're also selling beers on Conga. I was very interested in understanding if there was a shift in an increase in number of orders after the pandemic. And how does that look like? What percentage of that represent of your business? Um, I might not be able to go into percentages, but let okay. me say the follow. <laughs> um, I, I usually don't want to say we benefited from COVID because that would be wrong, for ethically wrong. But what COVID did was hasten the convert the sort of hasten the convergence of people being able to go online um, because of the restrictions and movement. People relied on companies like Conga to be able to get their deliveries, yeah? So we saw a significant increase in essential products, drinks, food, groceries on conga.com because during the pandemic, Conga was um, designated an essential service. So we could move around, we could deliver goods to consumers. And the focus for consumers then was really groceries and drinks, which is uh, natural. So we saw a significant increase in sales, which is still carrying us today because those ones that tried online shopping during the, the pandemic are still with us and they continue to, 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 to buy. And that is why it's important for us that once you've experienced our service, we want you to stay because we want to give you the best possible um, service. So we took advantage of the need of the people gave them wonderful service. We had multiple SKUs. We were able to work with um, OEMs to give us products. We had products across the warehouses and we were able to deliver faster. That meant that these customers are staying with us and will continue to grow with us as we evolve into the, into the future. Thank you for that. And boom, one other question that came from the audience um, is, is really around, that's more some, a question for an entrepreneur. His, he would like one practical advice that you'd give to someone who's looking to launch an e-commerce at a small scale in Nigeria. Would you have any advice for them on how to get started, on how would that look like, how they could get set up? What are, what are the main, I know you've touched a lot on the challenges, but what would be one of your recommendations perhaps on which where the starting point is for someone who would get started in an e-commerce business in Nigeria today? There are a lot of startups, there are a lot of companies that want to start e-commerce business in Nigeria. What sort of that question reminds me of was um, a few years ago when I was in Europe, I say a few years ago, really long, long time ago, <laughs> when people were talking about starting e-commerce business, the business, uh, the business models were very simple. I will start a website, sell a product, sell. If 1 million people buy at $1, I'm a millionaire, right? That was this traditional business model of e-commerce those days. I say it's a little bit more sophisticated now. You absolutely need to understand your target audience in Nigeria. The customers in Nigeria are more sophisticated than you think. They are very clear what they want and what they don't want. So understanding that target is critical. There are a lot of people in the country, but there are also a lot of people that know what they want. So identifying that need, that particular need, um, starting um, a marketplace today would be very difficult because of the cost associated to it in terms of infrastructure. Um, however, if you have the money to build the brand, to build the technology, to build the infrastructure, I say go for it because there is so much room to grow and there is so much demand for these services. My single advice is what I said, 
be clear on the target group and be clear on what you want to sell. Because for every idea that you have in Nigeria, trust me, there are millions of similar ideas and execution on execution on that thing is what is going to make the difference. Your ability to be clear on what you want to the target group and executing accordingly is going to be your, your success criteria. Everything else is secondary. And thank you for that great piece of advice. I'm sure that the audience is glad and happy to take that away from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, actually. That was that, that was pretty amazing. And it and it felt like a great kind of like landing point. So I'll I'll just like us to maybe over the in the in the last few minutes that we have to for you to tell us a little bit about you know what the future looks like for, for Congo Group in the in the next few years. Um, we've created the platform. We've cre we've sort of aggregated everything we need to aggregate. It's a question of how much we feed through that pipe. At the moment, because for three years we were very quiet, um, the reason we, it was on purpose that we were quiet. We were quiet because we wanted to actually do the needful and get the and turn the company around, which we believe we've done. Now we have a lot of interest from, of course, investors and people that want to take part in this journey with us. In the next couple of years, I see us having global partnerships. I see us growing 50, 100 times where we are today. I see us dominating the retail space. I see us dominating the, finance, the FinTech space with the licenses that we've acquired. And I see Conga being a household name in the next couple of years, not only in Nigeria, not only in Africa, but globally, because we do believe in the vision that we've, we believe in our strategy, we believe in what we've implemented, and now it's about time for people to see what we've done, and that is going to be happening. I couldn't think of a better way to 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 end this specific chat <laughs> this, that was amazing thank you very much so the world should be ready for for conga thank thank you very much nick for 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 taking the time it was an amazing conversation we're very thankful that we were able to to stop by on on our speaker series here at let's talk startups in africa are there any parting words that you'd like to share with, with the audience as we wrap up this conversation. Um, first of all, I'll say thank you very much um, for the conversation, the African Startup Lab. It was a very good conversation. One hour felt like 10 minutes. Um, what I want to say is this, the potential in Nigeria, the potential in Africa for e-commerce, for retail is endless. Um, the buying power might, it might look like it's not there, but every day we consume products. There is a, we consume a lot. So there is a lot of opportunities in Nigeria and in Africa. So do not be afraid of the challenges because it doesn't matter where you are, there will be one or two challenges. If you want growth, this is the place to be. If you want to see success, this is the place to be. So I welcome everyone to invest. I, I welcome everyone to do a lot of startups in this country, in this continent, because together we'll make the pie so much bigger. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I'm sure the people are listening <laughs> and a few and a few will be able to respond positively to your call. Thank you very much, Nick, for your time. It was a pleasure Thank having you. you. And till next time. Pleasure so, pleasure so much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Bye-bye.